with the talk in Alberta of a new irrigation expansion and upgrading and changing our storage capacity, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about this book that I read about a year and a half ago. For anybody watching, you'll see I'm putting up the book right now. It's called Who Speaks for the River? And it's about the old man river dam controversy. Now, you can judge by the title or judge by the cover of this book. The, the dam got built. It wasn't any um, surprise that this happened. So anyways, this is, a, this is a book that covers what happened in that time period. And so I'm going to cover that in this book review and we'll go from there. So I'd like to welcome you to Plants Dig Soil. This is the podcast that supports the consulting business of the same name. I focus on what I call an hashtag realistic regen ag. It means that it has to be proven and profitable, and it has to benefit farmers both now and in the future. The podcast is free, but if you want to go a little deeper, I encourage you to check out the community and online courses that I've created. If you're in Alberta, I can help you with funding that help you try new practices on your farm. And in many cases, this, this funding is covers the cost of my consulting fees. Consulting packages start from a simple Q&A to full, full farm planning. And the planning or the pricing reflects the independent structure of my business. I don't have any products to sell, so I just sell my advice. And I'll recommend them where I see fit, but I don't make any money from anything I recommend. We can work remotely or in person or a combination of the two. There's no long-term commitments and I give you everything. You're free to implement on your own with on your own or with another company, but I always love to work with people in the long term. So let's get into this book. There are many people and many groups involved here. I'm gonna start out which it covers a very small area of Alberta, but it it covered many different groups. The main one that was involved was the Pecani First Nation, and or at least that's how they're referred to in this book. I think there might be some changes in how they they're referred to now, but for the purpose of this book, I'm going to use that name. It all happens in the Lethbridge areas, in yeah, around around Lethbridge in that area, close to the mountains. So just to just to set the stage, this was less than a hundred years from the treaties, from the massive change that happened in the prairies and in the, the tribes that lived in this area. I just want to read a little bit here of setting the stage. For millennia, the Blackfoot peoples lived on the prairie. Life on the prairie was hard, yet the Pekeni and other Blackfoot tribes lived intimately with the river, land, buffalo, and all that lived and died with them. Their way of life, the harshness and the joy, is almost impossible for an outsider to grasp in our age. And I'm just going to cut away from the quote for a moment here. Think about things happening for millennia and having things change in a very short time period. For a long time, they only had dogs to move them from camp to camp and hunt the buffalo. Later, with rifles and horses, the Pekani greatly expanded their territory against other tribes in armed battles. Some tribes, fearing extermination, fled over the Mount Rocky Mountains. With horses and guns, the Blackfoot became a great power of the region. They had immense respect for the buffalo, but nonetheless took part in its destruction through overhunting. When millions of buffalo were wiped out by the white, Métis, and First Nations men with rifles, the Pekani and other Blackfoot tribes were devastated. And so this is an important thing, is that there's, there was massive changes, and technology, in my view, always seems to change things when you can do things faster than you used to. So when this project was happening, and when there was talk of needing um, a new diversion, there was division within the, the group. This goes uh, much deeper into the book. This is a lot of what the book covers. There was, there was a vote. There was a split in the council. And half the people or one side were, were wanting, the, wanting the dam to go ahead because they could see more money coming to them. And other ones wanted to save it 
or prevent things from happening. So there's there's multiple act or there's multiple sides on this part of the story here. And the next part that I wanted to highlight in here are the farm side of it. One of the main farmers that were part of it. I'm going to read his side of the story. At his in his viewpoint, we're running out of water too often here. You're letting all that water go down the river and just dumping it in the ocean. We can use that water and have and not have any negative impacts. You've talked about this way too long, about the positive thing, the thing that should be done. Now is the time it needs to be done. We want the decision now. We're already done studying. The best decision is already made. And now is the time to do it. So this was the farm side of it. Seeing the what they saw as a resource, which is the water, going down and not being used. And then a whole other side of it was the environmentalists and even people that had grown up on farms and had seen the natural areas. They saw large areas being turned into agricultural land and with irrigation that was going to make even more land moved into that or at least moved more intensively. And so you have environmentalists that are looking at this and saying they don't want to see the dam because they don't want to see more of it lost. So we've got three actors or three groups in this so far. And we have the government who has been doing the studies and who is going to help provide the money to have this happen. And everybody knows politics is messy. So I, there was an election coming up and people were looking at ways to help secure their votes or at least make sure that they were promising things to the areas. And things got pushed through fast. Now. This is where there was many studies already and people were getting tired of just hearing about studies. But unfortunately, when it was publicly announced what would happen, the people that were in the area that were going to lose their homes or the Pekeni or anybody that were going to be severely affected by it were only heard about it when the announcement came on. So this is, does not set a good stage for public relations or making people work together. So the rest of the book covers the the blockade, the RCMP, the run through the justice system. It is it is it it's fairly well written in terms of being able to have it read by a layman or someone who doesn't understand legal ease. It is written by a lawyer who was not actually part of it but had a connection to the area because of growing up in the area or seeing the area when he was a child. So he went through and just, I don't know what you would call it, I guess maybe you call it a forensic investigation or a going back and looking at things from a legal perspective in what all happened. It was fascinating for me because all of this happened about, was happening 10, 20 years before I arrived here. And so by the time I arrived here, it wasn't very fresh, but it was still in recent memory. So it's very interesting to get to know the history of an area and what has happened to make things get to the point that they're at. And also, I guess it's, it is, it's, I mean, it's, it's conflicting because there's many, there's many benefits to this irrigation water. And I think if it can be done properly, it can help a lot of the region out. But I think we also need to be careful of what we are doing to our natural environment before we before we just go ahead and develop it. So that is the book that I have suggested for this month. And I will talk to you again next week.